in praising God as we sing our opening hymn, number 304. Easter, people, raise your voices. You can follow along on the screen or sing out of the hymnal. It's number 304. Please join me in the opening prayer. Let us pray. Guiding Spirit, you come to us in visions and dreams, calling us beyond the narrow confines of our waking perceptions. Open our hearts this day as you opened the hearts of the saints before us, that we might understand Christ's teaching and share his presence with those we meet. Guide our footsteps on our journey as you guided the apostles' footsteps that we may go where you send us to share with the world scare, hate and violence your message of love and peace. Amen. The Lord be with you. Please take a moment and warmly greet your neighbor. Good morning again. It's good to uh, welcome, particularly those who may be guests with us today. It's good to have you here on this Lord's Day. As we do each Sunday, I want to invite you, if you are at the end of a row, to uh, take the attendance pad and sign that. Pass those down the row as you're comfortable doing. If you're not comfortable doing that, you can also register your attendance online at stmarscarmel.org. In each case, uh, it's helpful for us to know that you're here. And also there's a place there if you have uh, cares or concerns, uh, a place uh, for you to share those with the pastoral staff. As we uh, <clears throat> continue, I'd like to invite you to turn to the blue section of your bulletin as we do each week. Uh, there are a number of activities uh, listed there. I won't read them all. Uh, I'll trust you to, to read those. But we do want to invite you to examine uh, those opportunities. We have a couple things I would like to highlight. One is that, as many of you know, Pastor Julia will be moving on to her first solo appointment, July 1, and so we wish her well. And we uh, want to welcome our new associate pastor, Pastor Carla Elliott, who will start uh, July 1. And so what we'd like to do is invite you to go to our website 
and submit a picture and uh, a little bit of a welcome to her. We're going to put together a picture, book, photo. So you can go to stmarshcarmel.org slash photo project to upload your photo. And uh, if you need any assistance, let us know in the church office. And then we'll compile those together in a photo book for her that will help her begin to get to know our congregation. So we want to invite you to, to be a part of that. You may notice on the outdoor church signs that Trinkets and Treasures, our annual uh, United Methodist Women's uh, Rummy Sale, is this week. And so you can make donations if you'd like to do that by dropping them uh, by the church uh, this week. And then uh, come by on Friday and uh, take some things home with you. Uh, I will confess to you, my goal is always to take fewer things home than I bring, but... Either way, the proceeds go to the mission work of the United Methodist Women. As, uh, as I, another, one other thing I wanted to point out is that we are uh, beginning in a couple of weeks uh, uh, a summer project called Picnic and Play, Time to Picnic and Play. Uh, last, the last two years, we've had Wednesday worship on the lawn uh, outdoors. We're not going to be doing Wednesday worship on the lawn this year, but we will have occasional times where we'll have uh, singing and, and worship and a picnic outdoors. There's more information in the bulletin. If you have a favorite song you'd like for us to sing during that time, there is a, an opportunity you can cast your ballot for your favorite song in the narthex. As I said, a no, many, many more uh, things that you'll want to look at and, and consider as part of uh, your life of growth and mission. And so we... Uh, uh, as always, invite you to be a part of those things as, as a means for us to continue to strive to live out our commitment to make mission a way of life. At this time, I would like to draw your attention to this morning's uh, New Testament lesson, which David will read and which will be on the screen. The New Testament lesson this morning comes from Revelation chapter 21, verse 10, and then picking up again at verse 22 through chapter 22, 5. You can follow along on the screen or in your pew Bible, page 259. And in the spirit, he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God and the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there anymore, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night. They need no light of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. This is the word of God for the people of God.
Thank you, choir, Eric and Casey. That's, that's the last time the choir will sing until the fall, so they'll be taking their summer break. <clears throat> I know Eric has a, a lot of very fine special music uh, people during the summer, but thank you, choir, for leading us in worship. I didn't see what happened there. <laughs> At this time, I'd like to invite us to a time of prayer, and so uh, as is our custom, I'd like to invite us to a time of silent prayer in which we offer our petitions to God and invite God to speak into our hearts and minds, and then I'll lead us in a pastoral prayer. So let us, uh, let us be in silent prayer together. Offer our prayers and thanksgiving for the church and the world, saying, God of love, raise us to new life in Christ. We pray for the well-being of your creation, that we may promote its ability to offer praise to you through spacious skies, bountiful seas, verdant lands, and precious creatures great and small. We pray for the life of the church that our generous witness may broaden your table as all find a place to live and grow in love. We pray for the welfare of your world, that all leaders and people, young and old, will strive to live together in harmony while serving the common good. <clears throat> we pray for all who suffer any violence, pain, or grief, that they will know the comfort of your presence as you wipe away every tear from their eyes. We pray for the love made known to us in Jesus Christ through this community. For this and all other blessings, we give you thanks and praise. Today, we pray for all who have died, that you will bring them to the fullness of your joy, where mourning and pain will be no more. For so many blessings and for answered prayers, O oh God, we give you thanks through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, and whose prayer we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. East 10th United Methodist Children and Youth Center is an accredited early learning center in East Indianapolis. The center is an outreach initiative of East 10th Street United Methodist Church in response to a need for a safe place where the children and youth could go to learn and grow. They offer an income-based sliding scale for tuition costs and are proud to serve a diverse population. Programs include an early learning child care center, before and after school care, and summer days of youth. For information, visit stmarkscarmel.org backslash missions. Financial donations to East 10th may be given online at stmarkscarmel.org backslash give or by using the mission offering envelopes in your bulletin. Because you give, St. Mark's gives. Let us pray. God of the mountains and the valleys, of the dry places and oceans, your voice speaks to us across creation. The flowers and the trees sing of your majesty, and the stars of the night speak of how much 
we still don't know. As we offer gifts to you and speak our words of gratitude, help us to hear your voice anew. Give us ears to hear, faith to believe, and determination to truly listen to how you would send us into a hurting world. In Christ we pray. Amen. I'm going to read the gospel lesson a little in sections today and, and talk about it a little bit, so you'll need to kind of keep that available uh, as, as we go. I have to say, I was, uh, <clears throat> as, as I was worshiping here and getting ready to pray, our director of student ministries came, walked in, so Don, I'm talking about you back up here, on crutches, so I'm, I'm a little worried about that. As we had a, a weekend youth retreat and my student ministries director comes in on crutches, so what did you all do to him? <laughs> this morning our gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of John. Over the last uh, few weeks, we've been uh, 
during the traditional service primarily, we've been talking about imperfect followers of Jesus, as if there were such a thing as a perfect follower of Jesus. But today we're going to continue in that uh, story as we talk about a, a, a specific healing story. In the Gospel of John, there are a series of signs that John says, there are a series of seven different signs that point to Jesus as the Messiah. And this, uh, this story is one of those signs, but it's a little different than some of the others. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the, the similarities but differences between this story and some of the other healing miracles that Jesus um, has. So I want to kind of unpack it in sections a little bit as we go, which, uh, which is why I didn't have you stay standing because we're going to read it a little bit at a time. But it begins this way. This is after this, there was a festival of the Jews. Now, this, in that sentence, after this, is a healing story that immediately before this, in which Jesus heals an official's son. So we're going to kind of compare and contrast those two healings in a minute. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called in Hebrew, Beth Safa. If you go to Hebrew today... You can see this pool. It doesn't have water in it anymore, but there is a, an enclosed pool, um, in which has five porticos or porches. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. So I want to stop the pause there and ask you a question. How many of you have ever had to wait for something in your life? What are some of those things? What are some things that you waited for? Anybody want to share something you, you had to wait for? For my older sister to get married. For your older sister? Okay. <laughs> Hopefully she's not watching. What, somebody else said something over here. Wait for a baby. Yeah, wait for a baby. That, that's, that's been an answer at all three services. To leave for college. To leave for college, okay. For a doctor's appointment. What did you say? Oh, okay. All right. For the Cups to win the World Series. Well, so, yeah, well, there you go. Well, one of my questions, my next question is, how many of those things, for how many of those things did you have to wait 38 years? So the Cubs, you're, you're actually... <coughs> More than that, you know. But for most of us, waiting 38 years would be a long time, wouldn't it? That's a long wait. And so this is a story about a guy who's, who's been lying on his pallet in this place. And it's sort of this mysterious, miraculous place where there's this pool of water. And the water gets agitated. And when the water's agitated, uh, people are then put in the water, and they are healed. Now, there seems to be some quota on how many people can be healed because this person is there, and he can never get in fast enough. Somebody gets ahead of him, so we'll, we'll continue that story. He says, one man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to them, do you want to be made well? Now, what kind of question is that? Do you want to get better? There's almost, uh, uh, you know, some, some cynicism in that, as Jesus says, don't, you know. And the sick man answered him. Now, how many of you have ever told the story more than one time? <laughs> now, what happens when you tell a story more than one time? It kind of it grows, doesn't it? Yeah, it gets more like that. That fish that, fish that was this long <coughs> it keeps getting longer. So this guy has his story already. Jesus says, don't you want to get well? Clearly somebody has asked him that before. And he says, uh, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. See, there is this, this weird kind of quota thing where only so many people evidently can be healed. We don't know if it's because the water only stays stirred so long or as one, once somebody gets in and gets healed, nobody. But he's, he's been there a long time, and he's not been able to be healed. Now, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. 
So Jesus, now, what would, your, what would the logical response in that situation be for you if, if you were Jesus? For me, I would stand there, I'd say, okay, let me sit with you for a day or two, see if the water gets stirred up, and I'll throw you in. <laughs> right? Or some variation of that. That's the logical response, right? <clears throat> so let me help you. But Jesus doesn't say that. Instead, Jesus says, stand up, take your mat, and walk. And at once the man was made well, he took up his mat and began to walk. Now, that's a great story, isn't it? It's a great, you know, uh, just feel good kind of thing. Here's this guy, he's been there forever. He suddenly he picks up his mat, he's feeling better, he just begins to walk, he's cured. And it would be great if that were the end of the story. You know, that would be a, a great, great message, you know, Jesus. Now, however, I want to uh, I want to make a couple of observations about this story, particularly in comparison to the story right before it. In the story before it, there is a, an official who comes to Jesus and says, my son is sick, I believe you can heal him. And Jesus says, and, and why don't you come with me? And Jesus says, no, you just go, your son will be healed. And evidently the person believes him well enough that he goes and he's healed. There's this act of faith that happens. But in this story, here's this guy laying along the, the side, the pool, Okay, you can stop passing the note now. And we are in the, the lane along the side of the pool, and Jesus doesn't say to him, you need to have faith, and then I'll heal you. He just says, pick up your mat and go. I'm going to heal you. As a matter of fact, there is such a, uh, a, an important moment here in which this guy doesn't even know who Jesus is. So he's, there's no act of faith there. He's just, Jesus says, do it. He does it. He's cured. Sometimes I think when we talk about miraculous things or prayer, we think if we just had more faith, if we, if we were able to achieve a certain level of, uh, of spirituality, that God would do what we want God to do. <clears throat> but this story reminds us this is not about the faith of the man laying alongside the pool. It's about the love and grace and power of Jesus Christ and his desire to heal him. And so that's an important thing. Let's hold on to that because that'll be important later on in the story. So at this point in the story, not only does this guy not have any kind of saving faith in Jesus, he doesn't even know who, he doesn't know that this is Jesus. He just knows some guys told him to pick up his mat. He did, and now he's dancing away. He's celebrating. He's saying, thank God I'm healed. But here's the rest of the story. It says, now that day was a Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your mat. Now, I, th I think that's sad and hilarious all at the same time. So this guy, you know, they would have all known him. <clears throat> He had been there for 38 years. He's jumping up and down. What do you think you would notice in that situation? That he's healed. Thank God <coughs> this has happened. He's healed. He's well. God has, you know, there's been a miracle. But what do the leaders? It's the Sabbath. You're carrying your mat. Now, that's kind of sad. Many of you know, I've, um, my wife, Michelle, and I, the last couple of weeks have been in Arizona and New Mexico, um, attending a family wedding and then doing a lot of sightseeing. And we had one day where we had an activity in the afternoon, and then we had a museum we wanted to go to. And so we were sort of later in the afternoon than we'd planned to go to the museum, and we got there about an hour and a half before they closed. We had pre pawed our tickets, so we had our online tickets, and we presented them. And this, the person who took our ticket said to us, you know, it takes about three and a half hours to really see everything in the museum. You've only got about an hour and a half left. So the message I heard was, welcome to the museum. You're doing it wrong. 
And she, she made it very clear to us. We didn't have time to see everything. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, we did have time to see pretty much everything we wanted to see. But we'd done it wrong. You know, we weren't, we weren't doing it right. And there are those times in our lives where we probably have had that experience where you think, I'm very excited to do this. I'm excited to be here. And somebody basically says, you're doing it wrong. That's what happened in this moment. This guy was healed. He was excited. He was ecstatic. He was probably dancing. And these people who were observing him, they didn't, they didn't pay any attention to the fact that this miracle had happened. All they could say was, you're doing it wrong. You're carrying your mat. If you'd left your mat, you'd be okay. But you, you picked up your mat. And, and so they say, why are you doing that? And he said, well, let's go on. And so he says, uh, the man who made me well said to me, take up your mat and walk. See, he still doesn't know who it is. And they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up, take it up and walk? Now, the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd that was there. Later, this is uh, for those of us who grew up with Spin and Marty, meanwhile, back at the ranch, later... Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. Now, So now he knows who it is that has healed him. So you think that the, the man would say, there are a number of surprises in this story. You would think the man at this point would say, Praise God. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done. Instead, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. So he immediately tattles on him. Therefore, the Jews started persecuting Jesus because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered him, my father is still working and I also am working. For this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own father, thereby making himself equal to God. And so <clears throat> we kind of come to the conclusion of this story. There are other moments in Jesus' life where he and the disciples come up against the Sabbath laws. Probably the most famous is when they're walking through a cornfield and the, uh, the grain is ripe and they're hungry and so they take off some grain and they eat it and people say you shouldn't be eating it, it's the Sabbath. And Jesus replies to them, the Sabbath is not made for the Son of Man, but the Son of Man for the Sabbath. In other words, if the Sabbath rules causes you to behave ugly towards somebody, you have misunderstood the Sabbath rules. And it's the same way in this situation. <clears throat> Clearly, a miraculous thing has happened. And the proper response to that is to celebrate, is to, to, to give thanks to God. Instead, what they do is say, you know, you broke the rules. They miss the point. And I think when we experience the love of grace poured out in our lives and among people, and all we can think to say is, you're doing it wrong, we have missed the point. Those of us who are pastors and some therapists and other people, if you study uh, <clears throat> groups, uh, one, of the, one of the ways that we study groups is through a, a process called family systems, which you look at how, how groups of people work together. And if you have a, 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 one of the premises of, of family system theory is that oftentimes... If you have a family that comes and they say, you know, somebody in our family is having a problem and, that's, and they identify who that person is, a lot of times the reality is that the presenting person is not the real issue, that there's usually a systemic thing that's happening. And, and the reason I'm saying that, in this case, <clears throat> the initial response is, this person is the problem. He's carrying his mat on the Sabbath. But if you look deeper in the systemically what's happened, what you, what you realize, he's not the problem. The problem is 
the people who cannot see the movement of God and God's power in this situation because they are so fixated on a set of rules that they feel like they have to maintain and enforce. And so Jesus kind of reminds them that, that God's power transcends those rules and the enforcement of those rules. Now, what, as I reflect on this story, there are a couple of questions I would like to ask them. My first question is this. This guy has been sitting there for 38 years. Why the heck didn't some of you help him get in the water? Why would you sit around for 38 years and let this man suffer when all he needed was a little bit of help? That's question number one. Question number two to me would be, this person has been healed. Why would you not celebrate with him? The reality is that sometimes when we get better, it disrupts other people's life and their system. If you, uh, if you work with people who have addictions or alcoholism, one of the things that you realize is someone who tries to get sober or clean, oftentimes the people that are most disruptive to that effort are their closest family and friends who have a, a, a long-term pattern of helping them in their addiction. By helping them, I mean feeding their addiction. And so when this person gets well, it disrupts their life. And they, all they can see is this is now a disruption in our life. Jesus was a disruption for them. They thought they understood exactly how things should happen. And Jesus says, God's going to come and break in in new ways in your life. So the, the question that arises out of that is, are we helping or hindering people as they try to get better, including ourselves? Are we helping or hindering? And so as I think about this imperfect follower of Jesus, and this guy is pretty imperfect. He doesn't really even demonstrate any faith. He has not, uh, you know, he just is there, and Jesus acts upon him. And in this situation, it reminds us that God wants us to be well. And the questions that come out of that is, what are we doing that hinders God's effort and work in our lives, in the lives of people around us. So I'd like to invite you as you think about this story to reflect on who in your circle of friends needs you to throw them in the water. Who in your circle of friends needs you to, to notice, to see them, to make some effort on their behalf to help them be healed and whole. And who in your life has already begun to experience that healing and wholeness, but you're not able to celebrate with them because it disrupts your life. Jesus came and he said, I'm doing, I'm doing what God wants me to do. God and I are together in this. We're, we're, uh, we're of one mind about what should happen. And I think God still works in our lives and in our world. Uh, I'm optimistic about our world because I believe God is still God and God still does the things that God tends to do. But sometimes we either don't recognize what God is doing or we maybe even hinder what God is doing. So my prayer for us and for you is to consider who in our lives needs help. And it may be us. Maybe it means asking for help. And how can we help and not hinder the miraculous things that God is already trying to do in our lives? Because we can respond by celebrating or we can respond by saying, you're doing it wrong. We have a choice. And I think God wants us to celebrate the ways that God is acting in our world. Let us pray. Almighty and holy God, you do amazing things. Your creation is awesome. You have placed people in our lives that are amazing, but sometimes we don't have eyes to see it. 
Sometimes all we can see are the, the structures that we have put in place ourselves. We pray, O oh God, that you might expand our vision, help us to see your work, and then help us to be your workers in this world. We pray for the power of your spirit, the guidance of your discernment, that we might have eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to feel, all that you would have for us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'd like to invite you to stand as you're able as we sing our closing hymns, Wash, O God, Our Sons and Daughters. wisdom which transcends our imagination. We pray, O oh God, that you might heal us and let us be agents of healing to others in the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. Amen.